Hi, welcome back to the Coda podcast. I'm Molly Flower. And I'm Roger Harris. Here's a podcast from our Coda 22 event, which I think we really feel it was our best content yet. It was our best event yet. And it was so good to see everyone back together again after such a long hiatus, right? <laughs> so good. It was friggin' awesome yeah. to be back together. Um, so much to be proud of. Agreed. Maybe our best content ever. And how about having a uh, climate active or Australian government climate active certified carbon neutral event. That's a first. It was one hell of an achievement that. Massive achievement and there'll be lots more on the website that you can track down about how we did that. So please go to the website, check out the other podcasts and video content, the YouTube channel um, and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts and do share it with your network, tag us on socials and spread the word because this is the last Coda event and it's been one hell of a ride. So thank you for everybody who's been part of it. Yeah, an absolute privilege to have been part of it. For more more on the sort of winding up of Coda, check out on the website and uh, hope to see you all soon. Uh, our next speaker um, is someone I have known and admired for many years. Um, Dr. Maya Cubitt is an emergency physician at the Royal Melbourne, but she's so much more. She has a fellowship in paediatric um, emergency medicine, but now spends more of, more of her time on the other end of the spectrum uh, with the elderly in the emergency care of the aged and hospital in the home. Um, today, Maya is going to talk about trauma in the silver-haired generation um, and how we may not always be getting it right. So welcome, Maya. Thanks very much, Michelle. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And I want to say a big thank you to Roger and Ollie and the CODA organising team for this really awesome light box and platform to talk about trauma. And when I say trauma, I mean physical injury and how we might change the paradigm of trauma care. I also want to thank you guys for being here. It's a pretty tough time at the moment and I'm grateful to you for coming to listen to me. I'm also grateful to our colleagues keeping the workforce rosters going while we all talk here about the things that we're passionate about. We are the expert clinicians. We are valuable advocates for our patients. We are powerful agents of change and there's action that we need to take. I want to start with a story. This is Shirley's story. Shirley is 82 years of age and her home is a residential aged care facility. Shirley has some early cognitive impairment, but she's relatively independent, busting around on her four wheel frame. And we visit her every weekend. Sometimes we get ice cream. Shirley is my nana and that's my daughter, Lily. Now, of course, the story I'm going to tell you is not Shirley's story, but it could have been. It's a collection of many people's story. One day, it will be us. It might be you. One morning, at the residential aged care home, the carers are doing their morning rounds and they find Shirley on the floor. It's really unclear how long she has been there, and they can tell that she is not quite right. But on the background of a lifetime of not wanting to be anybody's burden, Shirley has progressed into a hypoactive delirium. She is very difficult to assess, and it's hard to figure out what's going on. So an ambulance is called. About five hours later, Shirley ends up in one of our emergency department ambulance corridors. You are the lucky team leader of the emerging subspecialty of emergency medicine, corridor medicine. You have the task of reviewing Shirley in the corridor. You chat with the paramedic, you briefly chat with Shirley. You order a head and a neck CT, a chest X-ray, some bloods, a urine, and you promptly pop her to the back of your mind. Wait, you go back, you take the collar off, those things are harmful. And you bond with the paramedic about a bit of a shared frustration that Shirley is there at all. These round trip prolonged visits to emergency departments that are overcrowded are harmful for people like Shirley. You know that. Quite clearly, Shirley's advanced care directive says she doesn't want life prolonging treatment. Is this necessary at all? Why is she here? And Shirley's journey continues. She finally makes it into a cubicle. 
Her head and her neck scan are normal. That chest X-ray is pretty unremarkable. An intern sees her, chats with a consultant, and Shirley's referred on to a general medical admission with the ubiquitous diagnosis of, you wait for it, urinary tract infection. After a day or so on the medical ward, Shirley's sent home to recover from her hypoactive delirium and that really prolonged and somewhat unnecessary round-trip journey. Except a few days later, Shirley still can't walk. And after another trip to the ED, she's finally diagnosed with her undisplaced rib fractures, a vertebral fracture, a neck of femur fracture, and when someone finally finds the time to wash her hair, that clot comes off and she gets a few stitches in the wound on the back of her head. Now, this story is heartbreaking. Parts of this story belong to so many Shirleys. And this is despite Shirley living in Australia with an injury management system that is held up as being one of the best in the world. And also with you and I working alongside her, well-intentioned clinicians who turn up every single day to provide excellent patient-centred care. So what's gone wrong? There's this moment in the working life of an emergency clinician like me at a major trauma service where a rotating registrar comes along, keen sponge, and a learning goals conversation is had. It is always, always, always about trauma. I want to learn intercostal catheters, Maya. I want to do a thoracostomy. I'm really keen to put on a binder. If there's a trauma call, I'd love to be involved. Can I lead it? But when I point to the Shirley's in the corner and I suggest we start there, there are looks of confusion. This does not fit their worldview of what trauma care is. It's not what they came to learn. The current paradigm of trauma care is one of a disease of bleeding. Where is the bleeding? And how quickly can I get this patient to their definitive surgical intervention? And everything that I'm doing along the way, gathering my team around me, resuscitating, permissing hypotension, preventing coagulopathy, all of it is with the goal of maintaining momentum towards that definitive surgical care. This paradigm evolved from the military. And for a few patients, more if you live in a war zone or maybe America, it remains extremely relevant today. Sure, we've managed to transition this paradigm to a more civilian setting of blunt and penetrating trauma, and we continue to try to maintain and evolve the good of this system towards those who deserve our finite resources, those who have the risk of the poorest outcome. And the way we do that is by defining something called major trauma. The major trauma criteria define our injury system. They aid our data collection, they define our levels of service, our funding allocation. They are what our system performance is measured against. And they generate our advocacy in the forms of, forms of injury prevention, public health advocacy, and policy recommendations. The concept of major trauma revolves around the accuracy of our assessments and our ability to diagnose injury. It generates a retrospective injury severity score with known limitations in severe injuries of single body organs, like isolated head injury. It excludes fractured neck of femur, and it excludes older patients greater than 65 who die of something that is thought to have precipitated their injury or death, some other cause. But with Shirley in mind, Maybe it's time to review our major trauma criteria. Maybe it's time to evolve our trauma paradigm again. Let's remind ourselves who carries the burden of injury in Australia and New Zealand. If we were to redesign our systems, who do they primarily need to serve? In Australia, Falls are the most common cause of injury-related hospitalisation, over half of which occur on the same level, less than one metre, the so-called low fall. In Australia, falls are the most common cause of injury-related death. From around the age of 65, 
our rates of injury hospitalisation increase dramatically. After a fall in Australia, somebody aged over 65 is eight times more likely to be hospitalised. Women are more likely than men to need hospitalisation over the age of 65, and that probably relates to something like underlying bone density issues. Over half of injury-related deaths are in those over the age of 65. In Australia, people over the age of 65 years are 68 times more likely to die after a fall. One in two of those falls will have happened in your own home. Only one in five happen in a residential aged care facility. And here's a little bit of pub quiz trivia for you. A woman is twice as likely to have had her fall in the kitchen. A man is 1.5 times as likely to have had his in the garage. Half of all hospitalised falls involve a fracture of the head, neck or limbs. Falls lead to an increased length of stay compared to all other causes of injury-related hospitalisation, but less critical care support. In those aged over 65, our length of stay averages about 10 days. In Australia, injury accounts for the fourth highest area of healthcare spending behind musculoskeletal injuries, cardiovascular disease and cancer. It's about $10.5 billion a year. Falls account for about 40% of that, about $4.5 billion a year. And even when we focus back in on that major trauma definition that we're all used to using in Australia and New Zealand, low falls in the dark blue is the most common cause of major injury in five out of nine of our jurisdictions. And low falls is the second most common cause of our most severe injuries, an ISS less than 13 in death in orange, or an ISS greater than 25 in light blue and black. Isolated head or head injury plus other account for about 40% of all of our major trauma. And if we assume that mortality is the outcome that we're interested in, after major trauma, low falls has the highest proportion of all deaths. Nearly 40% of deaths from major trauma occur in those people over, aged over 75. So, Shirley is not the exception. Shirley is the rule. And the paradigm shift that we all need to make is that this isn't somebody else's problem. We cannot add a geriatrician to every service. Trauma isn't all permissive hypotension and intercostal catheters. Sometimes it is much more subtle and much more complex than that. And as trauma clinicians, we should see this as our opportunity to excel. So, Despite this very, very clear picture of who carries the burden of injury in Australia and New Zealand, we know that older people are much more likely to be under-triaged. Under-triaged being the under-recognition of serious injury and treatment in a setting that lacks adequate resources, resulting in less effective treatment and poorer outcome. Which of course assumes that for all older injured patients, we know which patients are more likely to have a poor outcome, that we know which location they should be cared in, that we know which model of care works for them, which interventions, and that we know which outcomes matter to them. It is very, very clear to me that we do not know the answers to those questions. And that should make all of us feel really, really uncomfortable if we want to call ourselves trauma care experts. Trauma and expert trauma care is in our warehouse. Low falls are the burden of the injury of our population. And if we want to call ourselves trauma clinicians and make an impact for the outcomes of people who bear injury in our communities, this is what we need to be really good at. We have the tools to steer our trauma systems towards the patients it needs to better serve. And while we're waiting for our systems to catch up, on your next shift, this is what I want you to commit to doing. I ask you to be accountable to systematically, consistently, 
but more importantly, equitably, applying our basic trauma tools, our primary, secondary and tertiary approaches to injured people, our curious and caring minds to patients like Shirley. What is the risk of an underlying cause of her injury after her fall? Sorry, what is the risk of her underlying, having an underlying cause of her fall? What is the risk that she has an injury after the fall? What is the urgency of her ongoing assessment? What is her context? Does her current community setup provide adequate level of care for her? Will it still provide an le adequate level of care for her? Is she safe? What outcomes matter to Shirley and the people that look after her? Do we have an opportunity in this moment to intervene and alter the outcomes that matter to Shirley? Have I communicated well with Shirley to understand that? Do all of us have a shared understanding of the expected path for her? And where uncertainty remains, what am I going to do about it? In Australia, Shirley is what trauma looks like. And we are the experts that have the ability to advocate to improve outcomes that matter for her. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, and uh, thank you for once again bringing up the issue that Liz said, uh, talked about first off, and then the climate session, which is advocacy and patient advocacy, and it feels like it's been a, a really important thread through what we've talked about this morning.